Hey guys, Luke Summers with Power Athlete. It is an honor and a privilege to bring you this episode of On the Long Road with John Wellborn and Dr. Fred Hatfield. Unfortunately, as I film this, we have lost a legend, a man who has left a legacy. Dr. Hatfield passed away at 74 years old just a few days ago. This was our first remote filming of On the Long Road. We traveled to Houston to sit down with the source of knowledge as it relates to compensatory acceleration training and peak performance. We had some technical difficulties. Some of the camera work isn't the best. The audio could be better, but the information is gold. So please sit down, enjoy, be patient with some of the audio, some of the video, our talk with Dr. Fred Hatfield. This is John Wellborn. I'm here on the long road. Once again, talk to me, Johnny, live. We have our special guest, uh, Dr. Fred Hatfield, a.k.a. Dr. Squat. Um, has the, uh, you know, not only is uh, one of the most prolific power lifters in history, but also holds the distinction as probably one of the best podcasts we've ever done here on Power Athlete Radio. So, uh, Doc, thanks for coming today. I really oh. appreciate you taking the time of, with, you know, in front of your busy-ass seminar that you got going today, which we're going to, which I'm excited Perfect. about. I enjoy these. Yeah. So, uh, give us a little history, like give us the, the you know, the 10,000 foot. I mean, um, obviously we know, uh, you know, a lot about you in terms of the listeners having, um, you know, listened to the last podcast, but, you know, give us a little bit of history and hopefully we can, uh, you know, bookend this thing. All right. Nobody's ever asked me the single most important question. How did you get as strong as you were, being as little as you were? I'm just a short guy. I'm, uh, I'm not big. How tall are you? Five and a half feet. So five and a half feet. And what made the difference? That everybody wants to say genetics, but it wasn't genetics. When I first started this sport, there were plenty of guys lifting more than me. I had to fig I had to figure out how to beat them, and I had the the good the good fortune of going to the Soviet Union early in my career as a powerlifter and studying strength under the tutelage of probably the greatest sports scientist the world has ever known, Yuri Verkashansky. He was the guy that led the uh, Soviets to many, many, many gold medals in uh, Olympic lifting and all of the other sports. Uh, the Soviets dominated all of the world of sport, so many sports in the early days, in the, especially in the 60s. So Verkashansky, taught me the concept of compensatory acceleration training, C-A-T. You compensate for improving leverages throughout a lift by accelerating the bar. So for example, if I have, if I'm able to squat a thousand pounds, I go down into the hole, how much, how much do I push against the bottom of that bar? It's gotta be more than a thousand pounds because if it was just a thousand, the bar would be sitting motionless in the in midair. So, I got I got some equipment put in my gym uh, made by um, oh what was the name of that? I'll think of it. It was Eichen Kinetic Equipment. But I was able to push as hard as I can, and the clutch plates in the flywheel were such that it would create tension inside the machine, and I could only move the bar at a certain rate of speed. I could set it to move a foot per second or two feet per second and so forth. So by controlling the speed of movement, I knew exactly how much force I was putting against the bottom of that bar at any given moment during the conduct of the lift. I think you called it a torquometer. Uh, was that the torquometer we talked about last time? It might be. It might, I don't remember yeah. the name. I just used it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so, you know, and I, I, uh, I finally figured out that the real key to lifting a big weight was to push the weight as hard as I could every inch of the way. Not just in the first half a foot or a foot to get past its sticking point and then ease it on the way up. No, you push every, every bit as hard as you can every inch of the way, thereby increasing the amount of time under maximum tension. Everybody talks about time under tension. Sure. It's not, it's time under maximum tension. Anybody can, a baby can put tension on something, but that's not gonna build strength. You gotta put maximum tension. It's gotta be overload tension, more than you're used to doing. And so I can accomplish in one workout 
what it would take other guys five workouts to accomplish just by using cat. And that was a, a, a very important key. Now, there was another element of, uh, uh, that, that I contribute to my success. And uh, I hesitate almost to talk about it because it's, it's very spiritual. You know, in the Bible, for example, Jesus talks about climbing into your closet when you pray. What do you mean by that? A physical closet? No, of course not. No, I think he talks about like um, like most athletes, this idea of like uh, you know retreating within yourself, having a, a space where you shutting can... down your mind. Yeah. You're not thinking of anything. It's uh, no uh, five senses are shut down. You can't smell anything. You can't feel the sweat in your face. You can't you can't uh, gag on the chalk dust in the air. You can't even see the crowd. All you can do is go down and up one time. If you can get to that point of being in a real closet. You don't feel the weight. Well, at isn't all. that effectively, um, um, you know, being able to limit your senses to be able to focus on one specific task? Yes. And uh, I, uh, years ago, I, there, there was a doctor in Newport Beach, a guy named Dr. Jin at a Newport Research Center, mm -hmm. and he brought in uh, certain people, and he was able to come in and show that certain parts of the population have the ability to focus, slow time, and do these things that people, you know, assume are. Uh, you know, superhuman like Mario Andretti driving 200 miles an hour. Or Elite athletes all have that capacity. Sure. Uh, well, after all, what makes them unique? As elite athletes, they're able to focus all of their attention on one specific movement at a time. You know, they don't have what they call a monkey mind with thoughts running back and forth in their mind. You know, oh my God, I hope I don't get hurt. Or I wonder what my wife's doing with that guy in the back of the room. Nothing is in your mind. Well, and, it's like um, the, uh, I'm sure you've heard the old story about Ted Williams, where, uh, you know, Ted Williams, one of the greatest hitters in uh, Major League Baseball history, all of a sudden he retires and they want to bring him in as a hitting coach. And he was an incredible hitter, great baseball player, terrible hitting coach. All he did was scream at the guys, you can't see this pitch, you can't see this pitch, and he's calling the pitches out for these guys. <laughs> and they looked over at him and they were like, how do you know what pitch is coming? He's like, how do you not? I can tell by the rotation on the laces. And uh, yeah. the guys are like, you can see the rotation of the laces? He's like, you can't? So they started writing numbers and writing things on the ball and throwing them. And Ted Williams could tell every time what was on the ball. He had the ability to slow it to the point where he could actually see the rotation That's incredible. of the laces. That's incredible. But, you know, I mean, I've, I've run into, for, for me, uh, you know, playing in the NFL, um, I never heard the crowd. And all the plays were in slow motion. Yeah. So when guys ask me, like, did you see that move? I'm like, I saw it a mile away. Uh, I saw the guy move his hands. I saw this. And, That's what uh, it takes to play in the big leagues. Yeah. That's what it takes. And it's, it's not an uncommon uh, attribute, but it's all too uncommon amongst the rank-and-file lifters out there. They simply don't understand that they've got to slow everything down and, uh, and uh, focus on going down and coming up. And that's all they focus on. They don't focus on the weight on the bar. You know... Well, I mean, uh, like, don't, uh, it, it's pretty interesting. Like, I, I, I always, um, uh, you know, like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, having, you know, as a young lifter going in and training and, you know, using the, the barbell basic training lifts to, for football and for my sport, you know, training in, you know, George Angus' garage, I got an interesting observation of watching some strong guys show up and lift some big weights. And when I was a little kid, you know, you know 14 years old and I'm in there racking weights, I was like, why do they have so many weights, of, you know, plates on the bar? And what I didn't understand was that you have to keep driving adaptation, that the minute that it becomes easy, you have to continue to climb, to continue to climb. That's why they call it overload. Yeah. And uh, it seems like it's something that's lost, that like the minute it becomes easy, you have to constantly be challenging and forcing adaptation and driving adaptation. So what you effectively did was not only found a way to drive adaptation, but the ability to continually do that by moving the bar as fast as possible. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else, too. And I've tried all of the tricks in the book. Years and years before Louis Simmons or anybody else was doing elastic bands and chains, we did them. Back in the 50s, I remember lifting that way. Using compensor or using compensor acceleration against accommodating resistance? No, uh, no, with the, with, the, with the bands and stuff like that. I, yeah. I didn't learn the compensatory acceleration until relatively recently, you know, in the, in the late 70s when I went to the Soviet Union. But, but it, isn't that what the chains and bands really are? No. They think it is, but it's not. It's not. It, it is to a degree, but you can't. You can't beat the good old human body, and and uh, the natural forces. Your body is not designed neurologically to recognize elastic band tensile strength or no. 
or or something getting heavier and heavier as you lift it off further and further off the floor like a big old chain. It's it's like uh, uh, an unfamiliar territory, and you, your body doesn't recognize it. Your neurological system isn't geared to handle that kind of uh, of strange. Do you think it uh, overloads the central nervous system? I, I think it shuts it down mm. because it's not recognizing it. Interesting. So I never used that stuff. I tried it and decided that I could do it better on my own. And, uh, and I, I was able to prove it to myself with that strain gauge. I forgot, what'd you call it again? I, th I thought you told me it was called a torque meter. Yeah, like, uh, I, I got a mental block for the moment. But anyway, <laughs> so what I found we'll just, out- We'll just call finish, it, yeah, the strain meter I like the strain meter yeah, better. To, 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 to bring that story all back home, if I found out that I wasn't uh, applying greater and greater force to the bottom of that bar, that meant that I was not doing something right. So I'd go back to the drawing board and I'd, I'd take a slightly lighter weight or a slightly heavier weight and I'd find a, a, a weight that I was able to optimize the amount of force that I was able to apply throughout the entire lift. And that's how I trained. Every, every day was different. Some days I, 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 uh, I'd, I'd be able to do a lot more weight other days, I'd have to back the weight off so that I could just get the movement. So you got to know your own body. You got to be sensitive to to uh, stimuli from the outside, and that's why I got away from the bands and the chains. It was not something that my body could recognize at all. It was completely foreign to me. Mm, interesting. So, with your um, like, what did your training look like on terms of like, let's say, like a micro scale, like over the course of a week? Uh, did you squat twice, like standard people, bench twice, dead pole? Like how Nobody has like? a body that works on a, on a calendar basis. You know, sometimes it's going to take you a little bit longer to recover because you did a little bit more eccentric work or a little heavier weight. And sometimes you'll, you'll uh, recover very, very fast because you didn't do quite as much weight or you were working a different muscle group or some such thing. So every muscle group and every movement has its own rate of recovery years of experience you get to know you you plot stuff down you write stuff down you keep perfect records and after a while it starts to get to be second nature to you where you know exactly how much you have to do and and uh, how many days after your last workout are you able to get another workout in and uh, and for me it was it was I, I go by feel every single lift I go by feel if I feel ready I know that I squat four days ago so I know I'm gonna be ready but three days, maybe not enough. So I, I'd have to take another day. So every fourth day, I was lifting something big. On, on other days, I might l do the same lift or some assistance work, but with lighter weights or with greater speed. You know, for me, the, uh, uh, the only one that really taps me out is the deadlift. So for like, you know, deadlifting maybe once heavy, maybe every week, two weeks, couple weeks. Yeah. Like for me, I, I, can squat, I can squat way more often. Like I can squat heavy two, three days a week. Yeah. Deadlifting more than once a week to me is like. I was the same. Fucking destroys me. Yeah. Why is that? Because the weight is out in front of you so far that you're putting a tremendous strain on your low back. Uh, with, with squatting, I, I never had to worry about that because in the off season, I didn't have the weight out in front of me. Like most lifters have uh, the, the weight on their, on their shoulders like mm -hmm. that. No, mine, mine was with a safety squat bar and, and, and the bottom of the bar would, would uh, torque forward yeah. so that it was in the midline of my body and I had no strain on my low back or on my knees or anything. I don't know if you listeners know, but uh, Dr. Squat invented the safety squat bar, and actually, I'll tell you a little bit, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, George had one of the your original safety squat bars, and when he passed away, I hit up his widow trying to buy all of his old equipment, and uh, she lied to me and told me that she had thrown it all away, which she had, and she actually sold it to somebody else yeah. who contacted me about a year ago, said he had it, and I've been meaning to go up and try to steal it from him. <laughs> but uh, there was an old gym in uh, Costa Mesa called uh, Metrics. You remember oh, that? yeah, that's right. Sure. Yeah, uh, uh, Scott Connolly's channel. I did some work for them. So they had one of your original safety squat bars in there. So I went in there and joined the gym because they had the bar. And then uh, I walked in one day, and they had sold the gym to some, uh, you know, the 12, some, like, basically this, like, real bad kind of boot campy CrossFit kind of uh, gym. And they were getting rid of all the equipment. And I went in there, <laughs> and I was like, hey, what are you going to do with that old safety squat bar? And the guy goes, it's outside in the trash. 
And so I went out and I recovered it. And uh, we have that in our gym. And when people come in, like I'm like, dude, this is, they don't realize. I'm like, this, one, they don't make them like this anymore. And two, uh, you know, for me, I remember squatting on it as a kid. But uh, this one, I think, is black. Whereas the one I think George had was like a red, almost like a look like the interior of like a 60s Cadillac yeah yeah <laughs> it was like a red kind of velory thing yeah or like a, a, a um, like plastic so no but for those of you guys you know and everybody's gone off to since rip it off but so that so how uh, what was the rotation of safety squat versus uh, just a straight bar did you uh, do all like your heavy weights with the straight bar and then all your assistants work with the safety I squat? never used a straight bar off season at all wow in the last eight years of my my competition uh, and I didn't invent the safety squat bar oh I didn't know that. It, 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 it was invented by a guy by the name of, uh, uh, I forgot his name. Oh, my goodness. He's a uh, Jehovah Witness preacher from New Jersey. Never lifted a weight in his life. Uh, then He showed up at, at, a, uh, at a, uh, a fitness fair with that bar. And I said, what the hell is that? So he said, I wanted to try it. So I did. I, I fell in love with it instantly. Sure. Did, and uh, so I got to be... I got to be close friends with him. I think he's dead now. It's been, been quite a while. But uh, so I asked him, hey, you looking for somebody to endorse it? I have a pretty good name out there. You know, people might. And I, I it ended up getting, being called the Hatfield Bar. Yeah, yeah, Hatfield and, uh, Bar. And, uh, but that was my affiliation with, with the bar. And it wasn't me that invented it. Well, I we, popularized it. We, we used to do uh, the Hatfield squats where yeah. we held on to the, you know, we used to have, uh, have handles on the handles racks. Out here, yeah. And then we got into this idea of uh, basically being able to put your hands on the bar, like do a free squat with it. And then we got to the point where it I was I think like, that's a, a bad idea. I don't like a, my hands here. Because what happens is almost invariably down. you pull yourself forward. So I keep my hands here to keep myself perfectly upright. If I have to spot myself, I can. Sure. I'm not worried about spotting myself. It's not cheating. I'm only uh, in workout here. I'm not in a competition. Sure. So, uh, but, but by having my hands on the, on the uprights, I'm able to completely control my angle of pitch so that I'm, uh, I'm always perfectly straight up and down. And then your glutes and your hams and everything gets much more targeted overload. And you're not, it's not dissipated in the low back region. What's the, uh, what's the heaviest you ever handle on the safety squat? 1,200 pounds. Give or take. For set of five. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the mic drop moment. It's like set of five. All right, so so, so you handled 1,200. Uh, do you think that, um, I mean, because. Uh, I, I was I mean, helping well, myself. Well, yeah, bit. so I mean, so probably let's say 1199 you know, worth of work. But uh, do you think that the safety squat, um, you know, the one thing that I always noticed on the safety squat was uh, I actually noticed more development in my traps. And like my upper neck and the yoke and like that that part. That's why I always really liked it. Was not only squatting with it, but I just noticed it for like the upper body strength. Uh, I'd seem yeah. to develop, and, and I always wondered if like that, like kind of like uh, the analogy once we thought about was like a horse getting yoked up yeah. with like being and able it to put is. that. That's what it's like, like a horse getting yoked up. And furthermore, when you have the bar, a one inch bar sitting on your seven cervical vertebra, you don't know the damage that's doing back there. I've watched plenty of guys cripple themselves from breaking their own neck. It's ha I mean, literally, I've, I think I've seen it happen about four or five times over the years. <clears throat> and people just going down and just... Yeah. Now, the, and the other thing is when you have a nice cushy harness, yoke, as it were, you're not worried about anything. And you're, and you're able to put all of your thoughts and all of your mind and all of your... your, your uh, energy into pushing against the bottom of that bar. You're not worried about anything anymore. So it takes away the worry element, takes away the pain element, takes away the uh, all of the negative parts of squatting and makes it a, a, a beautiful thing. Yeah. Do, you, do you think people uh, uh, suffer from fear in the squat? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's probably the biggest, the biggest problem people squatting is that they're afraid of the bar. Are they afraid of the pain, or are they they're just afraid that it's going to fucking staple them and they're going to shatter into a million pieces at the it's, bottom? They're afraid they're going to get hurt, yeah. So, I mean, do you, do you really think you can effectively lift weights if you have fear of the weights? You really can't, can you? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, I could have gone out and played in the football if I had been fearful if, of what was going to happen to me. Let's put it this way. If you're afraid of lifting a weight, it's because you've never done it. 
once you've conquered the, your fear and made the weight, you're not going to be afraid of that weight anymore. But your fear has moved forward a little bit to another another level. So that's what you got. It's the only way you can handle it. Then handle it that way. Just sneak up on it. <laughs> the sneak attack. The sne I like the sneaking attack. It's like the uh, like the uh, the wily e. coyote. You know, yeah, like, I know. <laughs> don't want to wake up the bar. So when uh, um, did you find uh, like for like bench press or deadlift? Did you find anything that was kind of safety bar like similar? Like you you know you know you find the safety. Yes. They call it the trap bar. It's a, like a yeah. circle. Oh yeah, yeah. No and you get bar. inside and you deadlift. So the bar is being pulled up straight up the midline of your body instead of out in front of you. It's the out in front thing that I that I object to in training. Even though you even though you have to do that in a competition because you're using a straight bar, uh, you don't have to suffer the indignation of low back injury during training. Everything that you do in training is for safety. While at the same time completely challenging your your whole nervous system, your muscular system, you got to challenge it beyond what is normally used to being challenged every single time you work out. <clears throat> but not to the point of hurting yourself. What, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I'm a big believer in this in the trap bar. And I'll tell you something else. The, the dead with the, with the, that's for deadlifting. For benching, I have another revelation for you. What is it about dead, uh, uh, benching that's so dangerous? I'll tell you what it is. Here you have, let's say, 500 pounds in your hands and your scapulae are pinned to the bench behind you. So you lower the weight down and your scapulae can't move because they're pinned. Sure. So all of the stress is being borne by the anterior deltoids and the bicep head, the long head of the bicep, yep. and you're getting strained and you end up tearing a bicep or you end up uh, tearing a pec. The easiest thing to do, and I did it because I, I built equipment years ago. It's called sports strength equipment. I had a bench with two pads underneath my scapula that moved in and out like this against the spring so that I never got impingement of my scapula from the weight being heavy. And, I, I, and the, uh, my, my regular bench, my best bench was about 550 pounds, and I did 600 pounds with the scap pad wow. just by freeing up the movement. And it didn't hurt. Wow. I, I never could figure out, never could understand why that scat pad bench didn't take off because it was such a beautiful thing. So what was it? It was actually like, let's say there was a bench and then obviously the, the pieces moved this way? Yeah, nine, nine inches or 10 inches, all right? And uh, here's the bench right here. Mm -hmm. And the uh, scat pad was here and the scat pad was right here. And they moved in and out like that. And, uh, so as you brought the weight down, and the scaps the scap would come up. together. Yeah, would come together. And then as I pushed it, the, the scap pat, the scapulae were free to move back out. They weren't getting pinned anymore. Wow, that's pretty good. No, it, I, it I never was heard so that. simple. That no, so simple even a caveman could do it, huh? Hmm. And nobody came up with it. And well, nobody, I, I mean, I, like a shopping list now for the next. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to figure out. I'm like, man, first of all, they we got to figure out how to get some of this yeah. stuff. Well, you got to build it because yeah. nobody's building it. I, uh, my former partner lives in Pennsylvania. He'd probably build it for you. Uh, I think he's still building benches every once in a while, but Who, he's the only. Uh, his name is Trevor, Trevor Smith. Okay. You ever you ever hear the Smith machine? Mm -hmm. That was his father. Oh, yeah. The uh, uh, isn't it? the the most uh, uh, overused piece of equipment I've ever seen at a yeah. commercial gym: the Smith yeah. machine. I used to, add, I did my, my gig many times over as an expert witness in his court cases. Almost always it had to do with the Smith machine. Yeah. Almost always. I, I've watched uh, more people do more stupid stuff on a Smith machine than I've ever seen. Gold's Gym in Venice got hit $16 million. They don't like me very much. At oh. Gym. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because uh, you, you went in there and testified against them? I thing? had to. I mean, that's what expert witnesses do. I, you know. So you testified what that? Uh, that they were negligent. Oh, they were negligent. Well, I mean, aren't, aren't most gyms negligent? And just you know, not only in uh, quality of equipment, but also in equipment upkeep and just. Well, in this particular instance, there was a, a a safety stop built onto the Smith machine. They took it off because nobody liked it. Oh. So uh, down goes the guy, and he's a a, a, quadru a paraplegic to this day. Oh, jeez. Sixteen million bucks. Um, 
Do you think we could uh, avoid a lot of these problems if we actually taught basic strength training within to younger kids or at a, at a more basic level? Yes, and that's what my seminar today is going to be all about. I know, that's why I'm trying to give you a lead in. <laughs> to talk a little bit about the seminar see, that we're actually here today. The, these are called volleys. Just trying to let I you know, smash them out of, the, out, of, out of the park. John's good, isn't he? <laughs> let, me put, let me put it this way. I just got through giving you a big hint about working out. You don't have to replicate a competition in workout because it's not safe. So make everything safe in your workout by using kind of equipment that we've just been talking about and by not, not going to the point of failure. Everybody talks, you gotta go to failure. You don't have to go to failure. You compensate by doing compensatory acceleration with a lighter weight. Then you're never gonna get hurt. So uh, with, with the, I mean, we, we use, um, it was interesting, and I remember uh, the reason I hit you up years ago was uh, we had just got done with a big training cycle, and we have a you know pretty big group of people uh, you know with our back end training program, and we did a big testing thing. And the thing was amazing was the numbers; everybody got bigger and stronger. When I started watching videos, the one thing that struck me was how slow everybody was. Yeah. And I think I remember I hit you up, and uh, we started talking about. And, I, and my my big thing was like I just thought compensatory acceleration was something that people inherently understood the idea that you always want to move the bar with max acceleration because for me as a uh, football player, I mean, the ability to go from here to here, and especially to be able to accelerate my hands, like, it just made sense with the barbell. I should always move this. And same with jumping or squatting. I mean, nobody jumps on you a see, box but nobody's teaching low. kids simple movement skills anymore. You know, back when I was in, in uh, grade school, I remember doing drills after drills after drills with, with, our, high, with our grade school uh, PE teacher. And they don't do that stuff anymore. I, I heard some rumors about you as a gymnast. <laughs> I th and I, I can't remember if you told me or somebody else told me, but I heard that you, after you got out of the military, you yeah. ended up going on and uh, we were on the gymnastics team? Yeah, in Southern Connecticut. Yeah. Southern Connecticut. And we heard a rumor. Uh, who, who told us? Was it, uh, you, you know uh, Tom Inkledon? Uh, he, uh, Tom. Familiar name. Um, yeah, uh, human performance specialist is his company out. I, I believe he worked with your daughter um, and was a contemporary of hers, and he also worked in... Uh, um, in uh, Zatoskorsky, or uh, sorry, Verkashan, no, Zatoskorsky's lab in uh, Penn State. Yeah. And so, yeah, Tom, and I, and I know he, he he's uh, good friends with your oh, daughter. Oh, now I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah so, my, my daughter went to Penn State. Yeah, 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 so yeah, he, yeah, they're, yeah. Uh, but I remember Tom told me a story of something about uh, you being able to do freestanding handstand push-ups. Oh, yeah. Uh, and like uh, something like, uh, you know, 50, 100 in a row, no problem. I got I got into a, uh, a uh, an argument with a, with a weightlifter. No, with a I'm sorry, with a gymnast, on a flight on a flight uh, coming back from uh, the World Championships. He's he's telling me that he could do more handstand push-ups than I could, because he's a gymnast after all. And I said I'm a gymnast too. And he looks at me and he looks at me. and says you weigh three two hundred pounds. What are you talking about? So I did. I I kicked the handstand right in the aisle of the plane, and I cranked off twenty. I said match that, <laughs> and he couldn't. <laughs> So how uh, how did you go from, you know, obviously you, uh, um, I, I, you know, there was a, oh, and somebody uh, messed around on your Wikipedia recently. I don't know. You got to check it out. Somebody uh -oh. changed your nickname to, I think it was uh, Dr. Master Blaster Pro Super Elite Gamer. Bro. Bro. Yeah, it was funny because I, I, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll go I back. We'll do something like that. Some fucking jokesters, <laughs> but uh, it, it said that uh, you grew up in an orphanage. I did. So you grew up in an orphanage. I did. I, I, I uh, every day working, milking the cows, weeding gardens, plowing fields, stuff like that. And then you uh, went in the military. When you got out of the military, you went uh, back to college. No, and... first I went to Springfield College. I was going to be a gymnast because I love gymnastics, and that's that's where you go to be a gymnast at Springfield College. But I didn't have any money, so I said I want this. I'll I'll do the Marine Corps first, and when I get out, I'll go back to college. So that's what, exactly what I did. And then, how, and then how did you get from gymnastics into weightlifting? I've always been a weightlifter. The uh, first time I lifted weights, I was 12 years old. Coming home from school one day, I saw some older guys lifting in a gym, in a garage. So I stopped and I looked at them because I had never seen weights before. You know? and, uh, so, and, the, and the kid, the older kid said, uh, come on over here, let's see you try this. So I did. I, I picked up the weight on the floor. 
I didn't know what, what I was doing. I brushed it a few times and put it down. And, and all of the guys going, it was 125 pounds and not a one of them could do it. So I got a, I got a, a reputation real fast. So you were always inherently town. strong. Well, no, I, I, a hardworking guy at a farm, you know, well, I was I, baling hay and stuff like that. That makes you strong. So maybe the uh, uh, milking the cows, baling hay, working, doing some form of manual labor as a young kid, developing those neuromuscular pathways, metabolic systems as a young kid, allowed you to be I stronger. Believe, I believe it had a lot to do with it. It's like bulletproofing yourself, that kind of work. So having kids stay indoors, play video games, and uh, yeah, you know, right. keeping them safe isn't doing anything. Dodgeball. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's true. I mean, this is something that we you know we talk about a lot. I don't of understand it, but you know, to, to bring the story home, here's the thing: there are seven elements to human movement that you that are measurable. It's only seven. Now, little kids can remember seven things. They need to be taught these things because they're not going to just jump into their head. And if you teach them each of these seven elements and a way to use each one uh, in efficient movement, there would never be any such thing as a fat kid in our, in our, in our uh, society because they'd be moving efficiently and, and uh, you know, anyway, that's my little... Uh, so probably thing. like depression and shit too. You know what I mean? Well, like, I mean they they know that there is a direct correlation between movement and like you know self esteem, depression, intelligence. I mean, where the problem is is that uh, we've we've grown up in this idea that everything exists in a vacuum and it doesn't. Yeah, everything is fucking interrelated. But uh, what are the seven things? And they got me fucking wondering. Oh, <laughs> that the whole seminar is about the, the well, strength. We'll, ju we'll just list them off right now so that because right. okay, so if if you were to take. All human movement, whether it be swinging a baseball bat or throwing a bale of hay up on a truck or a, symbol, a sing, single step in the act of running or walking or the beat of the heart, all forms of human movement look like this. And follow that finger. You go down and you come up. You relax your muscle and then you contract and push something, whether it be your body or an implement. So it looks like a sideward S. That sideward S has seven different elements inherent in it. You have the eccentric strength converting from down to up, that space of time where you convert down to up, it's called amortization. Yep. It's very important in the world of sport. You want to get it, boom, like check mark, but you can't do it right away because you'll end up tearing yourself apart. apart. Well, we, we talked about this at great length. I remember when uh, even my own training, you know, the ability to speed up the eccentric movement is a key component yeah. to speeding up the amortization phase. And the ability to you know transition seamlessly between eccentric and concentric is really what you yeah. uh, said is the gold standard for fucking strength. Yeah, the faster that you can do the turnaround, the more explosive you are on the concentric. Yeah, without hurting yourself. Well, which is interesting because as I was telling you, since we moved out to Austin, I've been training at this Gold's gym, and every fucking person I watch get underneath a barbell in terms of a bench or a squat, every one of them stops at the bottom. Like yeah, they, right? they get to the bottom of the squat what is that all and about? they stop and they kind of like adjust and they <laughs> stretch and then they stand back up. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what is the idea? Like, I mean, I, I can understand maybe, you know, using it in some form of your training, you want to do some dead stop, work on starting strength, but every fucking person does it. Yeah. And, I, and, and it, it's, um, it goes back to years ago. I remember when I was doing my, uh, uh, grad or, uh, my undergrad at Berkeley, I took an exercise phys class, and uh, they talked about a study that they asked like 100 people. To, they just gave, you know, let them walk into a gym and said, hey, um, make yourself strong. Not a single person understood not only a rep range, a percentage, and these people had no exposure to weight training, but nobody inherently knew how to get strong. It yeah. was almost as if strength was, I mean. It's not important anymore, is it? Well, it just, I just don't think people understand it. Exactly. And, and But see, they understood it back in the old days because everybody worked hard. Everybody lived on a farm and bale hay and stuff like that, you know? So it was, it was in their best interest to understand the nature of, uh, of strength in order to get through life. Well, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, one of our buddies who uh, actually lives, uh, 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 Ed, uh, um, yeah, Ed Cosner, uh, yeah, he, he lives down here. Um, he has a deal where he wanted to go back and uh, lift all these kind of, uh, you know, stones around the world and go to Scotland and there's like the, you know, different stones and we were talking about it and he said that there's the fisherman stones. 
and there's you know three different stones and based off of the stone you could lift before you went on the ship was if you got paid a full portion a half portion or a quarter portion of and where uh, these stones were uh, in Scotland. In Scotland? Or uh, in Scotland or maybe in uh, Norway or they were somewhere up. Iceland. In Iceland. That's where it was. Yeah, yeah the fisherman's I have stones. a picture of myself lifting it. So he, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, look at him calling me out. Fucking I trolling. love, uh, can I find it? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't have it with me. Yeah, well, no, yo, how come oh, you don't fucking you know have it with I you? think I might have it in my, in my computer. Well, if you have that, we'd love to have it. But uh, we'll put it on our wall. The uh, But here, I mean, uh, there's a point where in fucking history, to get paid what a man should be paid, you had to lift. They a called it one. the manhood stones. That's what they were called. How, how, how heavy was the biggest one? I don't know. It, it was bigger than I could lift. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you didn't like snatch it up and yeah. fucking press it a couple times. This was like six or eight years after I retired, so I wasn't at my full strength. You think you could have snatched that thing? No problem. I think so. Not snatched it, but you know, yeah, certainly definitely lifted. got under lifted. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. So he was uh, he was talking about wanting to go back and lift all these historic stones, yeah. but I, well, I just I, I just remember that was kind of an interesting one that like and I and originally when he started talking about it, I was like, did you lift these after you get off the ship? He was like, no, you got to lift these fucking stones to get on the ship. Yeah, yeah. And there was one stone that if uh, you couldn't or if you couldn't lift the last stone, they sent you into town and uh, you were labeled as worthless. <laughs> and so like that's uh, a true story, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but 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 here's a these uh, Icelandic guys were. Badass. Yeah, I mean, well, that's why the fucking, you, you watch them. I mean, all the world's strongest man competitors comes from Iceland. They're all I from mean, Iceland, aren't they? Look, look at all the girls winning the CrossFit Games. They're all a bunch of Iceland girls, Icelandic yeah. girls. Do you know that at one point in my career, I, I went to Iceland twice, and I gave you know a week's, ten days worth of seminars for the uh, university there. So I, 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 they made me the honorary coach of Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> so they they uh, they know all of this stuff because I taught it to them. So why, uh, why has uh, strength fallen out of favor, or do you believe it has? Do you, do, do you think people are not as interested in being strong as they used to be? Or you think it's, oh, I, it's, I or you think it's caught a resurgence? No, I, I, I think the former. I think they, they've lost interest in it. Now they want, a trick. They want a, a trick to help them lift the weight. It's like become a circus act to squat anymore with those damnable suits on and stuff like that. Yeah. It's circus crap. That's not... That's not strength. You know, they can, they can uh, bitch at me all they want. I can take it. <laughs> it's circus. Well, as, uh, when uh, uh, at our gym, I remember I bought a mono lift and we, we were squatting out of a mono because what was cool is we could adjust the height and so we could have four or five different guys all train on the same rack instead of- Yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, be able to go up and down. I remember when I told George that we had a mono, he uh, almost had a fucking coronary on the phone. And uh, you know, told me that it's uh, it's not a fucking lift unless you walk it out. It's, it's it, and, he's right. And, he's yeah, right and he, he's like he's like if you don't walk the fucking weight out, I don't give a fuck what you squat. It's no, he's not right a good about lift. that. It makes it a big big difference. I'm gonna tell you where the mono lift came from. When I was in Hawaii doing 1,014 pounds, I I had made the decision that I was gonna have the guy pull the weight or pull the uh, rack out from underneath me. I let, I lift the weight off the rack. And I had a guy pull the weights out, uh, pull the racks out. That's where the monolith came from, because it wasn't against the rules. They changed the rules. They call it the Hatfield rule now, where you, where you got. <laughs> Look at you, just circus lifts, trying to <laughs> cheat. Did uh, I cheated every time I had a chance? It, you know, the rules <laughs> well, allowed it. Well, what, what do they say? If you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. Did uh, Did you squat that thousand fourteen in uh, in a marathon suit? Did you wear one of George's suits for I, that? I sure as hell did. Yeah, and uh, and the marathon gold wraps, and I remember George was very proud of that. I don't know that. about the gold wraps. Probably. Oh, well, I mean, George probably threw that shit in there anyway. George was like, he's wearing the marathon. Because I remember he had that picture, and it was like a big deal no, for George him. George used to take good care of me. He always supplied me with a suit and uh, a T-shirt that said marathon on it and stuff like that. But you said George wasn't strong. Well, I, I don't know how strong he was. He was oh, a he man. Oh, he was stronger than the average bear. Yeah. You know, but he, he wasn't... <laughs> He wasn't a competition tight, you know? Yeah, he, uh, uh, his big claim to fame, he was the Thompson powerlifting coach. And so he used to talk about those guys a lot. That's so, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, he was good for the histo history. I mean, for a young kid just trying to get, you know, just wanted to lift weights, it was. Uh, I, I love George to death. He was always so helpful and, and uh, you know, went out of his way to help people. So I always liked him. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say enough. You know, but he did have a definite chip on his shoulder. Yeah. I think it was because he wasn't as strong as he always wanted to be. <laughs> I 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be a, a bit surprised. Well, I mean, you think about it. If, if you're in the strength game, you make the suits. You're here. You're there. You know all these guys, and you're not able to lift the big poundages. It's got to be fucking hard. And you guys are about the same height too. Yeah, so. we're about the same size and height. Yeah. Yeah. He he won all that tall, which kind of makes me laugh. Seeing as I was like six feet when I was fourteen, and I was <laughs> fucking looking down on him. <laughs> so. Uh, you know what? I, I've been around pro football players my whole adult life. You know, because they, they naturally gravitate to me because I could teach them how to get strong. And uh, it never dawned on me that these guys were bigger than me. I always figured them to be smaller than me. <laughs> <laughs> not, not because I never measured bigness by height. I me measured bigness by how much can you move. Sure. And so. So you, you worked a pretty good uh, amount with the Raiders, you said, when you were yeah, living quite, out in Northridge? We have quite a few of the guys used to come over. And some of the... Uh, Tra uh, track and field guys from uh, UCLA and like who, that. Who, uh, who who of those old football players was impressive? You think could have done pretty well in the strength game. Well, Lyle Alzado, being one, but uh, you yeah. you know he lived in my hometown because yeah. I, I grew up in Palos Verdes. Oh, is that right? And uh, I trained him. And I, I'm the one that orchestrated his comeback well, into football. The my my Lyle Alzado story was uh, we were little kids at the beach and I had to be probably about ten or eleven years old and uh, we were. Like uh, you, you remember, um, you remember uh, uh, Redondo Beach. Yeah. Uh, you know, remember the big ramp that goes up? There was like a snack shack and like that big ramp. I vaguely remember. So I, we we were kids and we were uh, hanging out after we had gone surfing and we're waiting for our moms to pick us up. Whatever. And we were at the bottom of the ramp and Alzado comes walking up and he was running the ramp up and down. And the ramp's what about 60, 60 yards. Yeah. And I remember him uh, standing there in a tank top. And his chest was so big that you could have easily have sat a drink on yeah, it. And he was probably the, I mean, to this day, he was probably the most physically impressive person. I remember thinking to myself. Yeah, he was an impressive guy. Unbelievable. And we watched him run that ramp probably a good 10, 20, 30 times. And people were just standing like, like clapping, watching him run up and down this ramp. And was this during his uh, co uh, competitive this, years? Or this during his, yeah, oh yeah, this during would probably his, been 85, 86. Well, that's, that's, when I, that's when I trained him. Yeah, he's a fucking monster. I've never in my life seen anybody that big. He also drove a convertible Rolls Royce, I know, because he almost hit us a couple times. <laughs> that, that, was, that was when I was training him. So you think he, he was pretty strong? I mean... Uh, yeah, he was very strong. You know, he didn't, uh, I, I never had him do any max lifts, you know, because he was a football player, for heaven's sakes. But, you know, he didn't have any trouble at all doing sets of, sets of eight with 750, 800 pounds. While on the squat. Give or take. That's pretty pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. Always half field squats, safety squats. Always, always. If we didn't have a half field bar, we would go ahead and use a straight bar rather than miss a workout. But I took that thing with me everywhere. Sure. Nice. Um, what about, what about uh, oh, what's what up? What about young athletes? You want to talk about like uh, just you know like development of younger kids and you know because you're talking about hard work. Like, Fucking uh, like put he, on the, put he on the no well uh, like he made a, a a great point and and uh, um, one of our programs is called Field Strong and the reason it's called Field Strong was when I went to the the uh, uh, Philadelphia Eagles and I you know I, I grew up in Palos Verdes you know I didn't grow up on a farm I didn't grow up on any of that stuff but I grew up with brothers and we fought and wrestled and I yeah, boxed sure. and as a young kid and I was in martial arts and fighting and that was always big for us and uh, when I went to play for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, you know, we're in there lifting weights, you know, first day, everybody's in there fucking trying to show off. And I remember there was this big country dude, barely benching like 225. And I'm like, look at this fucking big fucking country bumpkin. Can barely bench 225. And then we went out to go play. All of a sudden I line up next to the guy, I'm playing left tackle, he's playing left guard, I sit back. And the dude like punches a guy and like almost knocks him off his feet. <laughs> and then we went to go double team a little bit later and he hit me and almost knocked me down. I'm thinking to myself, fuck, this dude's fucking tossing people he's big and strong he barely benched 225 so i slid up next to him at lunch and was like what's up like like what's going on the guy's like well i never really lifted weights i grew up on this hay farm and uh you know playing football seemed like bailing hay and he you went through his whole training you can't fight with a farm boy i'm sorry and, and uh so at that point when he started talking about what he did for his training i went back in my off season and was like i need to start putting together some what I call field strong because yeah, he yeah. was like cock strong, field yeah. strong, country strong, all that, you know, and he, he just called that's it cool. field work. Yeah. And uh, like that's why. Understood. Yeah, I mean, and like that level of training. And so when people are like, oh, what, what kind of training do you do for kids? I'm like, 
fucking you make them pick up a wheelbarrow, make them pick up and do a lot of these kind of physical training. That's things. why I, I'm a big believer nowadays in in uh, strongman co uh, competitions. I think they're great for Mrs. Jones, the 60 year old grandmother, and they're great for little kids, flipping tires, the farmers walk, yep. all of those. All of those are great exercises. If I if I were a younger man, I would have been doing that stuff myself. What I did instead, interestingly, was all of the same things that they do in a CrossFit gym. That was my boyhood. I could have, if I, if uh, slightly younger than I am now, I would have been the world champion CrossFitter because I could do all uh, that. How stuff. slightly younger? Like five years, six years? No, no, twenty. Okay, twenty <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you think I'm old, man. Uh, well, you so, so you think you could win the CrossFit Games oh, in your fifties? No doubt in my mind. No doubt in my mind. I can do a flag any day. I can do Iron Cross and pull out stuff like that. In your fifties? In my forties. Your forties? Yeah. Shit, we should have. We should have fucking go back in time and get you into this CrossFit thing. Yeah. So, uh, but are, see, that's the stuff you, I did. Are you a fan of the CrossFit stuff? Huh? Or well, I mean, are you a fan of it? I'm a fan of everything. It helps you build yourself without hurting yourself. The way they're doing CrossFit nowadays is very dangerous. They're doing highly technical snatch movements and kip ups and a high bar for time, for speed. And you know, that's a that's a sure way of getting self hurt, you know. Yeah, doing a kip up is great. Doing a a cross is great and all all of the all of the movements that they're doing are great. But you don't predispose yourself to injury. Yeah, my my daughters do and, uh, gymnastics, and when we go, and I I go with them a couple of days a week, and just you know sit and watch. And the one thing which is interesting with the gymnastics is you know obviously the the volume of time which they train is probably about an hour, two hours, and everything is max effort, followed by big recovery, yeah. because uh, the movements are so technical that if you do if you don't do everything at max effort, you're probably going to hurt yourself. Exactly and the execution right. of a movement. Yeah, so. now Mrs. Jones can't do a kip up on a high bar. You know, at 60 years old, she has no business trying it. But they try to get all of their people to do these stupid wads, what they call wads, workouts of the day. And uh, they're not created by anybody who's expert at, at uh, you know, developing training regimen and protocol. Do you think it's so, it's more valuable for these people um, to just like to develop a strength base that which, which they can build upon? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, uh, Little bit at a time, work their way into some of the really neat movements that uh, that uh, that they do in a CrossFit gym. You know, I think everybody should be able to do parallel bar work, even at 60 years old. I I have a, a, a video at home of an 80 year old woman doing an exercise regimen routine on on the on the parallel bar. She's doing kips, she's doing handstands, she's doing L sits, and uh, release and catch and all kinds of other neat things that 80 years old any if she can do it anybody can do it but you got to work into it slowly what uh, uh how impact i mean we, we taking a step back um how impactful was your trip to russia so like you said you went there you trained with verkashansky and that i mean was there anything that you walked away from i mean obviously compensatory acceleration but was there anything that you walked away with where you thought to yourself shit we're totally right or totally wrong on this oh they were Stone Age in their approach to training, the Russians were, and they were making do with really Stone Age equipment and stuff like that. But but they did everything right. What they did have every single gym in Russia had a force platform in it. Every gym, not a single gym that I've ever been to in this country has a force platform. What's a force platform? It's where you can measure the amount of force, force that you're exerting in a squat or vertical jump or something like that. Sure, yeah, like uh, force plates. Yeah. So they and, you know, so I mean, little things like that really mean a lot because if you don't have instantaneous feedback, how are you going to correct it? You can't remember what your vertical jump felt like two days later. All right, you got to feel it now. Go by feel. So some uh, inherent periodization. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. And then the, you know, the whole thing of periodization was began in Russia, as was plyometrics. Plyometric training is, without question, the, the single most important contribution of the Russians to modern-day training methods. 
and they had it down cold. They knew what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, if you go read any of books yeah. and all that He's the stuff. one that started plyometrics. Yeah. He didn't call it plyometrics. Fred Wilt, an American coach, coined that phrase, uh, but Verkashansky called it uh, uh, what did he call it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank too, and I know exactly why. Like I, depth I, I, jumps or something well, like that. Well, he, yeah, I mean, uh, well, shock training. Yeah, shock training. Yeah, shock training. The ability to like, you know, but his whole deal was the um, accentuation phase. You yeah. Know? You know, can can you transition from an eccentric to a concentric load? How fast you can do it? Check mark. Yeah. I mean, the ability to uh, reduce uh, foot contact time. Right. Exactly. Right. See, yeah. that, uh, guys don't know that kind of stuff here anymore. You know, just nobody knows that stuff. That's what I teach, and that's why I'm around doing these seminars. Well, we're stoked to hear it today. I mean, I'm. Uh, I feel like I got an insight. I mean, having not only red power. <laughs> but, uh, you know, done compensatory acceleration for the last, I don't know, I'm 40, so since I was 14 years old, so 26 years of using compensatory acceleration in my training yeah. and using it to go play, you know, 10 years in the NFL. And cool. So, um, anything else you want to talk about or uh, anything you want to share? I mean, I got uh, a story. Oh, oh, confirmed. yeah, yes. Okay, throw it out there. Yeah, te Texas uh, got one. So, sticking with... Oh, that's true. Yeah, sticking with Russia. I won't. I won't reveal my source, but they told me a story. They were uh, they were assistant coach in Colorado, and so they used to pick you up from the airport and drive you. So you were telling them a story one time where you go to Russia, and you're just going squat for squat for their strongest man. That Would they this had. be Doc Crease? Must have been Doc Crease. This must right? have been Doc Crease. So squat for squat in Russia, and then you were feeling a thousand, and you were telling your training partner, and then as you were working your way up to a thousand. The man got scared. They were getting nervous. So your training partner just gives you a little nudge and says, "You know what? Uh, I think we got a got a sandbag. We got to give this one so we get out of the Soviet Union." No, it wasn't my partner. It was it was that guy's coach. Oh, okay. Oh, the so, uh, uh, the Russian coach, coach was like, he "You said, beat him. If you're... you beat him, he will be shit forever." <laughs> That's what he said to me. <laughs> you know, uh, when I uh, took... so I had, I let him save face. We 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 went away with a tie. Uh, right. When when I took my trip to Colorado, I met Doc Crease. Yeah, yeah, he's a good dude. Strange guy, boy. Ooh. Yeah, he is. Doc and I have been down the road together. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? Um, so maybe, maybe oh, uh, the, the the only other two things I want to wrap about was um, uh, the zigzag diet, uh, which uh, was one of my early, um, you know really understandings in terms of how to like periodize and how to cycle the diet you know the idea of you know I still believe in the zigzag diet I have I have different points of view now uh, you know the science has come a long way in the past 30 years on diet for example back then everybody was preaching you got to stay away from the fats you got to stay away from the fats and the only thing that your body can use for energy is carbs so the carbs had the with well, the pinnacle of the uh, energy which uh, we know is not, not true. Anyway, so that's all different now. Sure. But the zigzag dieting is still important. And, and, and it's very simple to remember. If you're not doing anything over the next two or three hours of your life, eat very little. If you're doing a lot in the next two or three hours of your life, eat a lot. You eat for what you're going to do. You never eat for what you just did. Well, we always, uh, uh, the way I, that, you know, I always understood the zigzag diet was kind of a, a you know, heavy, medium, light. You know, the idea that, you know, if I'm going to train heavy, I'm going to eat more and like, you know, buy up by a thousand calories. If I'm here, I eat X. And yeah, then yeah. if I'm, you know, eating less, it's like, you know, a thousand less. And I yeah. used to, you know, let's say I was eating, you know, I need to eat 3,000 calories a day. Some days I eat four, some days I eat three, some days I would eat two and I would kind of alternate back and forth. And I found by actually kind of, you know, not giving the same amount of calories every single day, I actually found that my performance and, body, and you know, body composition, everything actually improved. Yeah, I have no doubt. And, and uh, so I still believe in that. I think it's the right way to do it. That's the way the bodybuilders have been doing it for years and years and years. And uh, they eat five, six, seven times a day. You know, so I used to preach that. I don't. I no longer preach that part of it. But uh, in fact, I more recently in the past, uh, since I had my cancer, I've been doing uh, a um, like fasting and uh, ketogenic. Uh, yeah, ketogenic fasting and you know intermittent fasting. They call yeah, it, I guess, yeah. where I eat twice a day, and and uh, never never after five or. Something like that. So how, how long do you fast for? Usually what, like 16 hours, somewhere in there, 15, 16 hours? Well, if, if my, my last meal is at... Uh, five o'clock. Yeah, is at five o'clock. That's when I eat. 
and uh, the next time I eat is at 8 o'clock in the morning. How long is that? Yeah, it would be 15 hours. 15 hours. Yeah, 15 hours. Give or take. I mean, the uh, pretty interesting, your, uh, the story on the ketogenic diet that obviously, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys know, but Doc got diagnosed with cancer and ended up kicking the cancer in the teeth using a ketogenic diet. Yeah. What kind of cancer were you diagnosed with? It was, it was uh, I had prostate cancer, which had, which had metastasized to my bones, which is typically the kiss of death. Yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> when it metastasizes like that. Uh, in fact, the doctor gave me three months to live. So I said, okay, I don't, excuse me, I don't believe him. And I'm going to go do everything that I can do to prove him wrong. And I just happened to have a buddy who's a, a research scientist at University of South Florida. He was studying the ketogenic diet. And so I hooked up with him. And, Who and, is this? Uh, uh, his name is Dominic Oh, Diego Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's Smart guy. Yeah, he's, he's, he's really kicking ass on the on the. He on is. The, he's he's uh, getting quite a name for himself in that yeah. field. So that's and, uh, some Christian uh, TV station picked the story up. I forgot what the name of the station is, whatever. But they and, and all over the United States, people have been calling me and calling me and calling. Tell me about the ketogenic diet. My father's got cancer and stuff. Oh man, it just about wiped me out. <laughs> just having to talk to people about yeah. it. Yeah. I, I did my best. I, I I didn't turn anybody away, but I said first thing I said, look, I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know anything about cancer. All I know is I did this diet and my How, cancer went away. What was the what was the time frame from diagnosis or in ketogenic diet to where they uh, ended up giving you a clean bill of health? Well, I, I I did the ketogenic diet for nine days. That's all. By the ninth day, the keto the uh, the uh, cancer had virtually disappeared in my bones nine days nine days that's all i don't know i can't explain wow. it that's crazy i mean and it's, dominic, it's tough to even get into ketosis in nine days yeah well i was in ketosis in the on the second or third day i, I had keto sticks you know and i i measured my blood glucose so i kept i kept my glucose pretty close to 50 the whole time which is very low sure and uh that's what you got to do i believe sure. I, I i don't believe in i didn't even eat one single bit of carbohydrate I did, uh, when, when I retired from the NFL, you know, there was a lot of stuff with uh, brain injury and traumatic brain injury for NFL yeah. players. And so I did about a year-long ketogenic diet where I didn't really eat a carb for an entire year. And uh, I ended up coming out the other side and feeling 100% better than, you know, because when you look at all the research, I mean, really... The well, only that was very wise of you because... I, I have a smart friend from Harvard that yeah. uh, pulled up every study he could find, and his yeah. recommendation was a ketogenic diet for yeah. not only acute but chronic brain injury is one of the best you exactly know, right. ways they've treated it for the last hundred See, years. See, because well, pe people never really realize this about ketone bodies. They, they can penetrate the blood-brain barrier, yep. and it becomes fat then becomes the brain's primary fuel source, fuel of choice. Well, I mean, I mean that, that's really how we're designed. I mean, if you think about the human body, it's a lot like a Prius, you know. I mean, the idea that, you know, when you're just kind of motoring around, living in this, you know, normal life, you're a fat burner, and then all of a sudden you got to hit the gas to train or run or evade or do something, then all of a sudden, you know. It makes a lot of goes. sense, doesn't it? Yeah. But, I mean, then, then you run into, you know, that's why we always talk about uh, people that are metabolically deranged being, you know, sugar burners yeah. constantly yeah. burning off a of carbohydrate because you know the body's smart it's going to use whatever it has most readily available yeah. and if you eat a low fat diet and low you know low protein and a high carb diet the body's going to all of a sudden adapt over and start using carbohydrates as primary energy and form. that exactly is what was taking place for the last 45 years in the united states why so many people are fat they were told the wrong stuff by the food and drug administration by their doctors by everybody everybody told them the wrong things doesn't that make you ill? Well, I mean, if you, about it? if you go back, you look at uh, Ansel Keys, you know, the seven uh, seven country study. I mean, that was in the 60s, yeah, yeah. you know, 59, 60. And uh, we've come to find out now here 50, 60, 70 years later that that whole study was funded by the uh, sugar industry. That's right. And That's they right. fucking paid them off and doctored all that bullshit. And next thing you know, for the next 50, 60 years, it drives a uh, fucking... He got away with it, too. Yeah. He got, he got paid the money and he completely fucked us up, you know? Now we're trying to do a little bit, and, but you know, even to this day, you start. Well, what do you mean? I, uh, I don't have to eat carbs as my prime. I don't have to wake up every morning and have a big bowl of, uh, you know, Cheerios. Uh, fucking yeah, Cheerios. You got to those heart <laughs> healthy grains. But I mean, that, that's how we all were raised. I mean, I know my dad was like, you know, here's your big bowl of cereal you got to have every morning because you got to have those <laughs> health healthy grains. 
and then all of a sudden I go to school and fall asleep in first class, not realizing yeah. that I'm in fucking diabetic insulin coma. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Well, you guys, thanks. Awesome. For uh, Can we get, inviting I guess me. one thing that, that resonated with everyone who listened to that podcast, I think you may know it's coming up, is uh, your speech about, or your speech To the Raiders. Passion. passion. To the Raiders. Uh, no, actually, Chiefs. it was to the Wait, Chiefs. Was it the Chiefs? Yeah. For for because they had a game coming up with the Raiders. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. Yeah. You know that 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 stupid little thing found its way into practically every locker room in the NFL. Yeah. Dude. And into our office. Yeah. So I was wondering maybe uh, if you wouldn't mind giving. Do you need us to go print a copy out or have a feeling? I like I, I don't have it with me. Do you, if I give you a copy, give you me a copy. Me? I'll do it right now. Yeah, yeah. It's on the Instagram. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here, text me my phone. Doctor, he's still training. I I I, I work out a little bit. Uh, I'm not serious about anything. Yeah. I just try to, you know, just to, move. Just to be able to move. Right. Yeah, I got it. Because I got really out of shape from that cancer thing, you know, and, and it's only been recently that I've been able to do anything. What do you like to do? I pump a little bit of iron, you know. I got my, that, that TV. Squats uh, a thousand pounds for reps. Yeah, right, right. Uh, 10, 45. For, yeah, uh, 1,300 for five. For five. <laughs> and I, I like that BMX thing, what do you call it? Is that what it's called, BMX? Piece of rope hanging down off TRX. the ceiling? TRX. Oh, TRX. I like that, and uh, easy stuff. Nothing, nothing crazy anymore. All right, you want this? Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind. Bust it out. Passion. It's not commitment to excellence. Rather, it's utter disdain for anything less. It's not endless hours of practice. It's perfect practice. It's not the ability to cope. It's the total domination of every situation in life. It's not setting goals. Goals too often prescribe performance limits. And it's not doing what it takes to win. Instead, it's a burning commitment to do what no one has ever done before or ever will do again. What was my initial reaction in terms of chatting so like, with Hatfield? Yeah, so like oh. after the talk. Um, I, you know, uh, Dr. Squat, you know, Fred Hatfield, a.k.a., is kind of such a larger-than-life person. If you've been in the strength game and especially, you know, coming out of Zangus' garage, I mean, I got to, you know, hear the endless story about, you know, Dr. Squat squatting is 1,014 in Hawaii and George's marathon suits. And so for me growing up, you know, there are these kind of legendary, you know, people that George would talk about, like, you know, Dr. Squat and Bill Kazmaier and, you know, the reverse hyper from Louis Simmons and, you know, the fact that we did the Hatfield squats and the safety squat bar and all that. So, um, you know, when we connected, you know, five or six years ago, um, you know, after our initial, you know, outing with Field Strong um, and that testing deal, and I reached out to him, and he was more than happy to, to you know, talk to me about compensatory acceleration and how to really, you know, revamp the training and really forced us to drive and start really, you know, implementing compensatory acceleration as a power athlete, really almost fucking pillar of our own training. So having used that and seeing you know, thousands of people use that in their training as uh, just this pillar has been huge. And then, to, uh, you know, connect with them a couple times on the phone and, uh, you know, reach out with them with questions. And then, you know, uh, I think it was awesome that we get to hear him, you know, present today and get to come to a seminar and then get to sit down and rap with them. And, you know, so what's, real- what's the vibe you got from him? Because I honestly, like, I only know him through like social media and our podcast. I didn't know what he's gonna be like in person. Like, well, I mean, there's a do bunch. Do you think of... he has that energy that like? Dr. Yeah, Tom, I like, I think he does. So I mean, he's he's I I'm sad that I didn't know him 20 years ago. You know, I think for uh, a guy like him, I mean, the fact that he got an opportunity to go to Russia, train with Verkashansky, and you know, read about shock training and really develop the idea of being able to drive. And he, he made a, one of the, a comment I've never heard before, but one of the more insightful ones I've ever heard was that it's not time under tension, it's maximal time under tension. The, maximal tension? No, the maximal time under tension is what he said. The amount or time under maximal tension is what he said. And that idea, it's like, it's not, it's not just time under tension. People don't understand about the idea of, of creating tension and driving it into the bar or how to move it. And I also thought he made a really interesting point. He said, you know, if you're constantly hurting yourself in training, then you're not really training intelligently. And, uh, you know, you should never put yourself 
in a situation to hurt yourself in training. You know, now if you go into a competition, which is the same shit I said, dude, I'd never want to get hurt in practice. Like, fuck it, don't ever carry me off a practice field. Carry me off of the fucking game field in my game unis. At least I feel like I did that. So the idea of getting hurt in the weight room, hurt in training, um, is something that I've never subscribed to, and I have a hard time wrapping my, my, my head around. I mean, you know, when I owned a CrossFit gym or we meet these people that are all injured, I'm like, well, how'd you hurt yourself? Well, I hurt myself in the gym. Were you competing? No, no, I was training. Well, why the fuck are you hurting yourself training? It drives me absolutely fucking batshit. You know, and you see these guys, you know, they got fucking 27 rolls of, you know, fucking rock tape all over them and this. And, uh, you know, I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm like, what are you guys doing that's not, al- that it's not allowing you guys to get out of your training healthy? One, you guys aren't warming up. You're sure as hell not cooling down. And this whole fucking, you know, a cheetah doesn't stretch bullshit that's permeated through the CrossFit deal um, is just bad. I mean, we were Tex and I were talking about it at breakfast. Um, Every NFL game I went to go play in, I literally walked off the field after pregame thinking to myself, I don't know how I'm going to play this fucking game. I'm so tired I was. I was literally covered in sweat, fucking thrashed to the point where I went and I would sit down in my locker and I'd be like, I don't know how I'm going to fucking do it. Take a sip of water, relax, chill out a second, compose, and all of a sudden walk back out there and fucking crush it. And if I didn't do that, I wasn't ready to play because I tried it once. And that's what I think most people are completely missing the fucking boat. And that's why we're pushing out these warm-ups because we're trying to offer people a little bit, a little slice of fucking intelligence and trying to teach them they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And you know what? All the rock tape and all the fucking skins and all the wads and all the fucking beyond the whiteboards you want to do is never going to fucking replace... Uh, people that have gone in and competed at the highest level and been successful. I mean, Dr. Fred Hatfield's a fucking legend in not only the strength, but I mean, really, the, the one of the, I think, I believe he was the second guy to squat over a thousand pounds and by far the oldest and the lightest. So he was, what, 42 years old, weighed two, you know, 242, and, you know, belt. with a loose belt that he <laughs> forgot to tighten and fucking blasts up a thousand fourteen. I mean, fucking beast, man. He, um, he definitely uh, very inspiring, and I was glad that we got to get this on. I mean, my one of my biggest regrets was not, you know, when Zangus was alive, getting him on to do this and being able to, um, you know, hear these stories and really like chronicle them. And um, you know, we've had two great talks with Hatfield, and I have a another one that I don't even think we pushed out, which was about a three-hour recorded conversation that I had with him the first time I ever hit him up, and. Um, it was cool. Um, I'm stoked. I'm really excited to go here this strength seminar today because, you know, as much as you think you know about it, then all of a sudden you go and you listen to these guys talk and he says something where you're like, oh, fuck, that really is insightful. So I'm stoked for it. It'll be good.